Hi, I'm David Oyelowo. I play Commander Tom Adewale uh, of the space station Ether in the film The Midnight Sky. Hi, I'm Alvin Drew. I'm an astronaut. I've flown two missions on the space shuttles where we did outfitting and construction of the International Space Station. And I'm Alex Lin, a reporter for Supercluster. And this is a conversation between a silver screen astronaut and a real life astronaut. David and Alvin, I wanna thank you both so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's thank a pleasure you. to be here. Awesome. So I'll start us off with a question for the both of you. Um, I wanna talk about the intersection of science and popular culture. First to you, David, how did you prepare for the role of an astronaut and were there any fictional or real life influences that you looked to? Um, yeah, it, it was uh, incredibly interesting, actually, because obviously there are lots of depictions of space cinematically. But, you know, what I found in um, watching several documentaries about folks who were actually on the International Space Station is it's a lot more boring than in the movies. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot more routine. Um, it's a lot more... Um, meditative, it's a lot more quiet. Um, and that was really fascinating to me and, and something that anyone who sees the midnight sky will see that we tried to infuse that into it. We tried to sort of take some of the drama out of the quiet moment so that the dramatic moments feel even more dramatic. Um, because that would be the reality, uh, it, it seems to me, compared to what we, uh, we watched and, uh, and what we researched. Very cool. So bearing that in mind, Alvin, being a real life astronaut, what do you think Hollywood has really gotten right and really gotten wrong about the way you're depicted? So I'd say about the last maybe seven to 10 years, the, the quality of the props, the backdrops have just really gone crazy. I mean, I've, I've <laughs> watched these films you know, having been up in space twice, and it just gives me a powerful sense of deja vu. You know, when I see the upholstery for the seating is the exact color, when the instruments are exactly where they're supposed to be, when spacewalk scenes look like it did when I was out there doing my spacewalks, it, they, they just absolutely nailed those things. Awesome. And so on the other side of that, where they, they weren't quite right, um, is it just goes right back to what David was talking about, is that the pace of things in space is a lot slower than you're going and really actually fits well into a two hour feature film. And so you'll see things like rendezvous and docking, which you've ever seen it on ass TV is a goes about like watching paint dry. Um, mm -hmm. It's just, and so you'll see these ships will come together very quickly, which for those of us in space, like those are 2 million pound spacecrafts that struck each other at that speed. That's, it's just breathtaking, but <laughs> you can forgive that because it, it makes for a much more, entertaining feature. The point of the movie isn't to be exquisitely accurate. It is to tell the story so you get the sense of it, even if it's not exactly technically correct. Right. I have a feeling um, there's some movie magic that's needed if we want people to stay in the theater. <laughs> Otherwise, they might be there the whole day. Yeah. So, David, I'm going to hand it over to you here for any questions that you might have for Alvin. Yeah. No, I'm really, really fascinated to talk to you about this, Alvin. I mean, yeah. You know, when we um, when we were in the process of putting this this film together, um, one of the things that was really tough to get one's head around in in our film, these guys are supposed to have been on the space station for two years. Um, that's an immense amount of time generally, but to be up in space in, in an environment like a space station specifically is, is obviously huge. I don't know how long you were ever up in space, but you know, can you entertain the idea of being up in space for, for that amount of time? So I had two missions, both of them were exactly 13 days. Now I had one of my former crewmates spent an entire year on it on the space station and then wrote a book about it called Endurance. Uh, it would depend on the spacecraft. Now, once I left the astronaut corps, one of the first things I worked on was a project called the Deep Space Habitat Project, where we really thought about how we would send people to Mars, which would have been about a three and a half year experience round trip to get to and from Mars with our current technology. Uh, how do you have a crew of like five or six people work and play? And so one of the things that I noticed on um, in the midnight sky was the, the size of that spacecraft, it's about 500 to 1,000 tons. And you think that's a bit extravagant for five people on, an, on a plant on a journey, but it turns out that it's 
about right. We think that a vehicle that would go to Mars would be the size of the International Space Station, as big and extravagant as that would be seen compared to an Apollo capsule. Um, the other things that um, I would um, let's say about a, a journey like that is uh, one of the things I thought they captured well in the ether is that they had this huge green space. You've got this, you know, this this big windowed area with all kinds of lush vegetation out there. And and one thing you don't realize you miss until you leave the Earth is that green space. You know, smelling something that is you know, you know, vegetation, things that are verdant and moist, as opposed to kind of the sterile environment you see on board the space station or the space shuttle. Uh, and we, we worked on things like that particular piece. These things had windows where you could look out into space. And so you weren't just cooped up in a tin can. So uh, those things you would need if you're going to be stuck in a tin can like that for two years round trip. Yeah, that brings me to another question, which is, you know, what are the things you've mentioned vegetation there, you've mentioned being able to see beyond the space station itself, but what are maybe some of the surprising things that you think one would really miss for being away from Earth for that amount of time? I mean, 13 days each time, maybe you're not quite getting to the point where you're, you're, you're really missing certain things. I mean, maybe you are, but, but you know, in your experience or, or the experience of your, some of your colleagues, what are those unexpected things? So the thing I missed right away um, was the sense of day night. You know, we have roughly 12 hours a day, 12 hours of night. And if you're, if you're orbiting the earth at low earth orbit, you're having 16 sunrises and sunsets every day. And so there's no correlation between where the sun is in the sky and the time of day. Once you leave Earth's shadow, like you would if you're going to the moon or interplanetary space, the sun is shining all the time. There is no, there is no nighttime. So you have to simply shutter the window. So um, it's hard to tell what time of day it is. And for me, you know, I've never actually needed a watch most of the time. I could tell you within 10 minutes what time of day it was. But when I was in space, I never knew what time it was. It was just you know, maddening to have to look at a clock all the time. Uh, another thing, like I said, is about the vegetation. Uh, one day we had a, um, a, a Russian resupply capsule come to the space station on the morning of Christmas Day. And in it, we always pack produce because you, those things don't last very long. So we always, every time we send a resupply ship up, we send up you know, carrots, lettuce, apples. And I just remember them opening up the hatch and they had nothing on the schedule for that day. And the last transmission we got for them the whole day was, we've got the hatch open, we smell apples. And that was it. You know, they just they went in there and just devoured all the, the fresh produce there was in there because they hadn't had any fresh produce in weeks. Wow. Wow. Um, one of the things um, in our film, uh, which I guess is understandable when you have a crew of men and women together for two years on a space station is my character and Felicity Jones's character. We end up, you know, having a baby together uh, or she is at least pregnant. I imagine that is something that is uh, would be frowned upon, something that would not be the way forward. Uh, should you have men and women on a space station together for that given amount of time? I mean, what are the rules? What 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 you know, even though it may be a, a, a natural occurrence, you know, what, what, how, how does it tend to play out being an actual astronaut? So there's no written rules, not even verbal rules. It's just expected that astronauts will conduct themselves in a professional manner that reflects well upon NASA and the country. Um, having said that, if you're going to send a crew out for several years, it's not unconscionable. I mean, we've had crewmates who were married, and so that you might have kids. Now, the part there where NASA would frown upon that is physiological, less social. Um, in microgravity, even some of the toughest animals like salamanders and cockroaches will spontaneously abort in microgravity. It turns out in order to get the cells of a fetus to go to the right part of the fetus, it's using gravity. So all the cells that are gonna be your eyes have to find the other eye cells and, and form an eye. They need gravity. So you would not have a normally well-formed fetus in that. And so you know, one way you get around that is if you have artificial gravity, such as you had aboard the ether, but I'm not sure the scenes where you know, she's going through the tunnel and, and, and zero gravity on the spacewalk. I could see the NASA surgeons just cringing at that, going, no, not, with a, not while you're with a, with a wow. fetus. Yeah, you wouldn't want to do that. Wow. Re that's really, really, really interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, for you, you know, as a person of color, um, you know, with, within... Um, NASA within that, you know, one of the things I've had people asking me is, gosh, we don't see many black astronauts. I mean, we see some and, and uh, it's, it's wonderful that you exist, but, you know, are there, are there inherent challenges uh, being a person of color when it comes to space travel? So 
one of the big things is, is like you said, you just don't see other other people of color. You know, the, the folks we've had in our astronaut corps with us, they're all open minded. They're all you know fine people. But there's you know you said there's, there's they come from a different culture. They may come from a different background, and and sometimes you just feel like you're a bit isolated. And in fact, probably and, and it comes from the fact that this there's this the estuaries that flow into the astronaut corps aren't very well stocked with people of color. You know, if you're coming out of you know, flight surgeons, test pilots, uh, research scientists, um, lab scientists, those folks are just aren't typically, you know, those STEM career fields aren't well populated. And so I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because one of the things I'm working on is a thing called the, um, the Patty Gray Smith Fellowship, where we mm. try and give opportunities for exceptional black undergraduate students um, to work in some of these, these career fields and to inspire those folks into to go into those career fields and also to get a sense of that normalcy. So when your company and somebody of color is interviewing with you, you, you work with them, you've interviewed them and you have a sense of how they may be culturally different. The body language is not going to be the same and uh, or no for something, but that doesn't mean that they're, you know, that, that, that they're communicating what you think they are or they have a different perspective. And that's a, a good thing. You want to have multi-point perspectives on solving some of our problems. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I mean, one of the things I, you know, whether we like it or not, you know, so many people, their first interaction with astronauts or space will be watching a movie. Uh, uh, and, and that's probably where the ambition comes from. So it's not lost on me that even the representation that, you know, myself, Tiffany Boone, Demian Bashir in this film, showing people from a different demographic doing this is of course incredibly important. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I celebrate you and I'm so glad you're doing that um, because to, to have a future where, where this thing opens up a bit more is a, is a fantastic uh, thing. It's still, well, they'll see more, more people will know your name than mine. Uh, I think it was, it was no coincidence that when NASA was first going to recruit black astronauts back in the seventies for the space shuttle, they turned to Nichelle Nichols who was Lieutenant Uhuru on board the Starship right. Enterprise who, right. who broke the color barrier. It's the first time you've seen somebody black on the bridge of a spacecraft out there and an officer to boot in the Starfleet. Um, she was the one who helped them with their recruiting drive because everybody knew that she was, no, she was our first black person in space. Wow, that, that, um, that, makes, that makes the midnight sky even, even more um, of, a, of, a, of a project I'm passionate about hearing you yes. say that because um, that is, a, that is incredibly important. Um, tell me, what are the challenges being an astronaut poses on family life? Obviously, it's an incredibly um, challenging training regime. It's very involved. Um, you know, even if you're not going up into space for months on end, I imagine that it's very specific in relation to family life. I mean, you know, that's one of the things that the film looks at, you know, in terms of George Clooney's character, just how much of his life is dedicated to this and the challenges it poses to his connection with family and those he loves. You could argue that myself and uh, Felicity Jones's character, all of us, you know, are on there, you know, that's a very specific kind of person who chooses to leave Earth for as long as we do, years, um, knowing that you have family. What are those challenges that, that this job poses? You mentioned a lot of those and, and the separation, um, the even the long hours when you're there because you've got to be dedicated. The one part that I'd never really appreciated until I was doing these missions was um, just the visceral feel, you know, that, that you're doing a very dangerous thing, you know, launching in, on a, in a spacecraft, you know, millions of pounds of thrust, you know, this is fireball, you know, going to take you out in the vacuum of space and your family's watching you do this. I mean, that's just, and, and oftentimes there's network cameras, you know, just zoomed right in on them while they're having this visceral reaction, like, oh my goodness, that 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 thundering blast that's shaking the, the stands right now from five and a half miles away. One of my loved ones is on top of that right now being carried off into space. Um, and so I think that the Tom Wolf in his book, The Right Stuff, really captured the fact that underlying subtext of that book was not about the seven Mercury astronauts having the right stuff, it was about their spouses and the strains and stresses they put up with, with, uh, you know, with just the, the, the media attention, uh, the absences, the danger. When it's, uh, it was a whole lot more dangerous business as it is now. And, and they took off. So his, his punchline was that these women had every quality that their husbands had. And so I think it was, it was kind of a delicious irony that you and Felicity Jones are a couple on there because you know, you're both these folks who are doing it. You're, you're both down for the same adventure. Wow. What, what's the relationship therefore to death? Because, you know, most professions, unless 
I don't know, if you, maybe if you're a NASCAR driver or, you know, there, there are dangerous professions, but, you know, exactly as you say there, that there are so many variables that could lead to a mishap, um, you know, with a, with a spacecraft. So what, what part of your brain does death, its proximity, its reality, you know, what, do you see a commonality in the way astronauts approach death as a reality? Don't know if there's a commonality. I know that from my community, the folks who were military aviators, who were test pilots, you saw it firsthand. Nobody who got into the astronaut corps did not witness one of their squadron mates die um, in a mishap somewhere. And so it was, wow. it was ever present. Um, the scarier part for me, at least, wasn't that I might get killed, but the effect it might have. And if you've got a family that depends on you for income and emotional support and just being a part of that family and suddenly you're gone, what happens after that? That was a far more terrifying thing. Uh, one of the things we figured out after the Columbia accident was that those who didn't come from that type of background, it was still a very abstract thing. Those, it misapprehends them. I they would tell you that you know, this is not like flying a, uh, an Airbus or a Boeing jet across the Atlantic. This is a much more dangerous thing you can do. And uh, the accident rates that they're projecting, and even then, this is before Columbia happened, said that you know, we fully expect to lose a shuttle on every 50 missions or so. And, and, and they just, it's hard to get that through your head, uh, that level of danger. Uh, unless you viscerally experienced it. So we, we try hard to work with those folks to get that across to them uh, okay. while they're making those decisions. Is there a fundamental difference between simulations, the training you do to feel what it would be like to, because obviously you're not simulating the actual projection into space because that in and of itself is so expensive and is so specific. So many things have to work in order to do that. Is there a fundamental difference between the training, the simulations and what it actually feels like to be thrust into space? So 10, 15 years ago, I would have told you, yes, I mean, it, you, it, it just gives you the basic skills, but it's not going to give you that feel of being in space. I've done lots of time in aircraft simulators, and it's not the same as being out there dealing with turbulence and air traffic control and all those things out there. But I tell you, on my very first spacewalk, I go out the hatch, not knowing how I'm going to react. And the thing that shocked me most was the sense of familiarity, like I had been there before. And I'm thinking... If I'd been on a spacewalk before, I would certainly have remembered that. Uh, and, and, and what I figured out was we're in a virtual reality laboratory where these guys clearly just had way too much time on their hands. They take actual overhead weather satellite images and project that into the scene below us. So if it was, say, cloudy over Atlanta, Georgia, and we're over Atlanta, Georgia, there would be clouds beneath our feet. If it was sunny over the South Pacific, there'd be glint off the ocean that we would deal with and off the side of the spacecraft. So it was a very realistic, very immersive experience to be out there in this VR lab. And when I got outside the door for the first time, it all felt very, very familiar. And so what they do is you might not have all the same, the, 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 um, the physical sensations, but you do that in a pool. And it felt the exact same way um, in that spacesuit in under 40 feet of water as it did up in the vacuum of space. And so it, all those things kind of, my, your brain manages to fuse those together pretty quickly. And so you wind up with an experience that is very familiar, which is what exactly they're trying to do. Um, now, you know, you might know the tasks. If you're somewhat freaked out by your initial experience, you're not going to get a whole lot of things done. And, and, and But that leads me to the question of, even though you know that it is close to a simulation, yeah. the, the thing that plays on my mind, I couldn't think of anything worse than for whatever reason, my tether isn't locked in or what, whatever it is. And I just find myself, you know, we saw this in Gravity, uh, which George yeah. Clooney did as purely an actor. And the notion of just floating off into space is just such a horrific one. Yeah. And the fact that it's not a simulation, and I know that there are all sorts of protocols and practices that make sure that doesn't happen, yeah. but you are in space, it's infinite. Yes. Uh, and so what, what, is there an extra layer? Does the heart beat faster? Is that playing on your mind? I mean, what does it do to actually being in, the, to actually be in that environment, despite the fact that it, it feels familiar? So when you're, before you go out the door, like especially on a spacewalk that you're talking about, I remember they, they actually hooked up a, a heart rate monitor so they can actually see my heart rate and it's, just before that hatch opens up, it's just pounding because uh, right. I'm thinking about this is this is this is not a drill, this is not a training exercise. This is an actual 
I'm going out the door in space. And then when I go out the hatch and I'm in space, the heart rate just went right back down to normal. Um, and I actually had to kept physically telling myself, this is not a training run. This is not a pool. There's not a bunch of safety divers floating in the water around me to go do things and think it's just me and my crewmate out here on this spacewalk to do that. Because again, the training kicked in. I'd done so many runs in that pool and I'm listening to the exact same chatter over the headset that I've been hearing during all the training runs. It was so absolutely familiar that even though, yes, you're, you're concerned about that. And it's, it's always in the back of your head that, you know, do your training protocols, you know, make before break, do all these other things out there that honestly, to, um, because of our types of our personalities, I was much more worried about that. I might not get all my tasks done, or I might break something that was worth $10 million than I was ever, mm -hmm. than ever really crossed my mind that I might float off into space once I got outside the hatch, uh, because I was just focused on the task. Wow. Wow. Well, I only have one more question, Alvin, which is yeah. what, what made you, what inspired you to be an astronaut? A couple of things inspired me. The first one was, uh, watching the Apollo missions. When I was growing up and dating myself, how old I was. And I remember watching the, uh, the crew of Apollo 11 on the moon. And I asked my dad, okay, well, I need to make some career decisions here. I'm five and a half. It's time to start creating my career. Um, wow. How much, what jobs can I, do I need to have to make enough money to go do what those guys are doing? And he's saying, no, there's a job called being an astronaut where they pay you to do that. And as a sign me up for that particular piece. Um, now this was maybe three and a half years after the signing of the civil rights act and discrimination didn't just evaporate overnight in America just because they signed that act. And so for some reason in my five and a half year old brain, I turned to him, I said, can black people even become astronauts? And he told me the story of uh, the Air Force who had hired an astronaut. He had been killed in, in a training accident before he go fly in space. But the fact is that it was there, it was a possibility. You know, there's no barriers between aside from my own ambition and my own accomplishments to become an astronaut. And I just uh, took off from there and just kept going. Wow. Well, gosh, uh, it is really quite something to speak to, Alvin. Thank you. Um, you know, and I, I, I'm glad you liked our film. That is that that yes. is that is the seal of approval that any yes. actor, any filmmaker is looking for. That someone yes. who's been through it yes. actually bought it, and so yes. that is the, the, that that's that's all I need. Yeah, just a wonderfully compelling film. You guys did a, the entire cast has did a wonderful job of it, and uh, I, I think I might just go see it again now. Think I've been thinking about it again. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Thank you so much, Alvin. Well, I think that's an awesome note for us to wrap on. I want to thank you guys so much for joining us in Supercluster here today. Uh, the Midnight Sky drops on Netflix on December 23rd. So space fans, mark your calendars. And thank you so much for tuning in.